Welcome to Velina's Talk. It's great to be back after a short summer break, and I have no better guest than Dr. Jacek Patuszak, who is CEO and founder of Strategy in Future, and a true political strategist, author of many, many books. The most recent one, which I bought in Warsaw, is dedicated to Poland, the best place in the world where East meets West. And as you can guess, we are going to talk a lot about true politics, Eastern Europe, the Polish perspective, and obviously also the most recent developments following the mutiny of Grigorzyn in Moscow. And this podcast episode is possible thanks to the support of Harapata podcast producer. This is one of India's leading podcast producers on politics and society. Welcome. It's great to have you back. Hi, hi. It's, it's great that you, you know, you invited me over to your show. I really appreciate it all the time and really appreciate the time spent with you discussing geopolitics. Thank you, Kalina. So let's start with your assessment on the most recent developments following the so-called mutiny. Some are convinced that this whole thing has weakened Putin and his power grab in the Kremlin. But then again, we saw that meanwhile, Wagner has expanded its scope of activities being positioned in Belarus. What is your assessment on the mutiny and the um, role of Wagner in Belarus and how is Poland actually taking action on these most recent developments? Okay. Thanks for those questions. Uh, I think that this event, this, whether we call it a mutiny or a, an attempted coup, and it is still, of course, to be decided, there will be books about it. We don't know yet all the details, what really was happening within the power structure of the Russian Federation, who plotted against who and so on. But still there are a few observations that we can make, and I'll try to de deliver while speaking to you, the perspective here in Warsaw as a front state on uh, NATO Eastern flank, the eternal competitor to Russia's empire, because that's how we perceive this war. Another stage of great struggle of the domination of the Intermarium, which is uh, the region between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea, who is in charge of events occurring here, his influence on the European peninsula. And this is the way that Russia projects its power and influence into the European peninsula. So that was the main objective of Putin and more. And Poland, of course, wants, wants to contain this desire, wants to deny the, the Russia this fight. So uh, having said that, I, I want to say two things about this, three things about this mutiny. First of all, in Poland, we felt the tremors of the potentially dying empire, which you know, of course, with, with the exception of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but this was something completely different. That was the external Soviet empire, basically not the core Russian state that was collapsing. And since for the first time, since the, the, the first world war and the collapse of the Russian army, in the first world war, we felt the, the first signs that the, the things might be happening and moving into that direction. And that's always a symbol of, of hope and desire in Poland, as we want to see Russia weak, removed from the European system of power and, you know, actually collapsing. We wouldn't have anything against it, so to speak. So everybody was watching with great attention every single minute, what was going on, on the way from Rostov on, on the Don towards Moscow. That's number one. That's one thing that the public global audience, the English speaking audience should take into account when you're listening to the guy from the Intermarium. The second thing, which was very evident was the escalation control that apparently was imposed by the Americans on the Ukrainians. Americans apparently were afraid and concerned that the situation is going out of hand and nobody knows what's going to happen with this Prigozhin move who Prigozhin actually is, what his, for example, attitude towards China, towards nuclear weapons, towards the United States and so on, would be if he were sort of a power structure after mutiny succeeded or if there is any civil war erupting in Russia. And as you know, but you know, the United States has been trying successfully to contain, to control escalation right since the hostilities started in Ukraine. Yeah, so they try to control the escalations. 
so that Russia doesn't escalate into a nuclear war with NATO or the United States, or the war is not expanded towards the NATO territory. And this event, I think, sent a scare to Washington decision makers, and uh, reportedly, the DC circles were calling upon the Ukrainians not to do anything that could look like a cooperation with Prigozhin or benefiting from this moment. You know, the Russian troops were watching and probably they did have a quite high quality morale at the time of this happening and the Ukraine counteroffensive started. So it seemed that the Ukrainians could have inflicted heavy casualties, losses or even broken the front, technically speaking. Nothing like that happened. And there were reports from the U.S. press that the D.C. administration was heavily leaning upon the Zelensky's people not to do anything that would put Russia in trouble. And the third thing is that the you know outcome of this all occurrence of the soul mutiny is you know the relocation of elements of Wagner Group and Prigozhin into the territory of Belarus, which is 200 kilometers from the place when I'm speaking to you now, and that's a game changer. You know, the, the English-speaking audience globally should know that it is Belarus that's a pivot in the intermarium and that the shortest way from Moscow to Warsaw, from Warsaw to Moscow, it's even more important than Ukraine in terms of buffering, in terms of buffer zone. And Poland will not sit idle to this. So, you know, the, the Wagner Group, all those guys who are not formally members of the Russian Federation Army, that creates this privilege of deniability in case the Russians wanted to inflict some sort of hybrid action against Poland, some sort of hostilities, but without breaching the threshold of Article 5 of this, you know, general war, they could always deny it's, it's the Russians. This sort of thing that, as you remember, Yasir Arafat was doing when he was relocated to Lebanon and uh, was stirring up waves in northern Israel. Yeah, creating a havoc, chaos, and so on. At the same time, of course, also undermining the Lebanese government. So what we fear is some sort of a gray zone, some sort of a chaos and operational base from which, you know, hybrid kind of attacks or other activities like that could be initiated against Poland without ability to be defined as sort of an Article 5 breach and so on. And Poland has to, will have to respond. Poland will have to adjust its military uh, strategy, its force deployment, training, and uh, presence in the east of Warsaw, and probably we'll see that you know happening in the coming days and months. How this is connecting also to the current developments regarding the Ukraine's counteroffensive? Now we are expecting expecting the most active phase of the counteroffensive. Uh, there are some, let's say, very controversial assessments and also articles, meanwhile, in the Western media, pointing to success, pointing to lack of success. I don't want to go into this, but would like to hear what is the Polish perception right now. And obviously, we have to say for our audience, there has been also a kind of polarization ahead and during the NATO summit in terms of expectations when it comes to the invitation to NATO for Ukraine, right? And Poland was in the lead, obviously, when it comes to the group of NATO members that are convinced that Ukraine should be part of NATO and should be member of NATO even now during the war, whereas the other bloc that obviously is led by the United States, and you explained perfectly what the calculus of the United States is. is. And here we see a very clear, I would say, controversy in this ultimate goal of helping Ukraine, not just to sustain the next and the next and the next attacks, but actually helping Ukraine to win the war in a comprehensive manner by gaining the territorial integrity from 1991. So what is uh, your assessment on the current developments and how these current developments will, you know, result in, let's say, more visible outcome this year? Okay, both very good questions and and tough, tough, tough questions to, to answer. Let me start by saying that the Vilnius summit was rather a fiasco from, of, of course, from the perspective of interests of Poland. Poland has been a staunch supporter of Ukraine since the start of the war, of course. We have delivered a lot of weaponry and other support, and we want Ukraine to win. 
And we would like, of course, the Ukrainians to win with the help of the United States and uh, as a big patron so that the Russians contain themselves and not escalate the nuclear world war. That would be the best option. And of course, it's not realistic because of the escalation control. Still, we wanted the clear path to Ukraine to join NATO, and it was not delivered at Vilnius. Politically, it means that Putin is winning the war, Belina. Because this is exactly why the war has started. It was started because Ukrainians wanted to join the West. So by it, war itself... Sorry to interrupt and, you, but it's very important for the audience also, I think, to say that it also started because Ukraine wasn't part of NATO. Exactly. And now it's evident that this war, you know, ensured that Ukraine is not invited to NATO. So politically, who is winning? Who remembers that Peter the Great lost the first battle at Narva in the Great Northern War in the 18th century, while he, he won after you know several years later and became a great power? So this is the way Russians are thinking, that this is just the beginning of a scalable world war. That's the first campaign of this great war that is starting, including technology. You, you have been discussing that in your podcast since, you know, since I remember, between US and China. And this is just a sideshow, you know, the sort of a repositioning of Russia in this great struggle, who is in charge of global affairs. And that will include technology, trade, capital movements, currency, you know, goods, energy, and also kinetic exchanges, proxy wars other competitions. So if you look at this from this helicopter view, then you see that the Vilnius was not a success. That's number one. Number two was uh, there were good things at, at Vilnius summit, like agreeing to cooperate on contingency planning in case of war with Russia, which is a good sign. And also some sort of promises that the ammo production in Europe will be increased, which was in shortage. Also the bet sort of observation from the Vilnius summit was that despite a lot of talk about deterrence by denial, there are no forces in the NATO Eastern flank, there are no forces available for deterrence by denial, but rather by punishment, which means that should Russia try to initiate any war against the Baltic states, still there are not sufficient forces to defend every inch of the territory. And that's been always a problem for Poland. That's always, we can discuss why later, but I don't want to spend all the time on that uh, discussing with you. It's not so interesting for the uh, international audience, but this, this complicates our planning, military planning, like, like hell, uh, if it's not a strategy of denial, but strategy that there's by punishment on, uh, on behalf of NATO, but coming back to, to assessing the chances in war, that's also a difficult to say. At strategy and future, we think that the evolution of the battlefield in general between the peer competitors, between peer players, is because of the precision weaponry regime and information, information dominance as a pivotal, as a center of gravity in the contemporary warfare, as opposed to mass concentration, as it had been for the last 200 years, is creating a conditions where offensive action, if their information dominance is not severe, or removed from one of the parties or so information access, right? UAV drones, situation awareness, it's, it is killing an offensive maneuver because of the minefields, because of the artillery, long range artillery, because all those capabilities to kill your mass tanks before they really have an impact on the front line. So if the, if two parties know what's going on behind the lines and can identify the concentration of mass and can, you know, impact it there is a slight chance for success in, in a, it's like the, the first world war in the Flanders, uh, Flanders of course but in a different dimension the maneuver has to be restored somehow it's going to be a tough call for the ukrainians even with the western tanks and so on of course if the russian troops morale is deteriorated to the level that they simply stop fighting then it's a different story but it has always been like that throughout the history you know, if the soldiers don't want to fight because their morale is broken for many, many reasons, then of course you don't need to have <laughs> to restore offensive maneuver. You know, you just move. As it also happened at the end of the 1918 to 
towards the end of the war when the German army simply uh, sort of not disappeared, but, you know, didn't put up fierce resistance, so to speak. And short of that, I think that towards the end of this year, the Western European partners will grow tired of help to Ukraine. This is what we fear in Warsaw and the ammo stocks will run out and the Ukrainians will be compelled to do some truce or peace on, of course, terms that are not as good as they had been before the war started. And that would again mean that Russia, long-term perspective, might be viewed as a winner of this opening, just an opening campaign of the great war for world. So in Poland, we do not, we are not blind. We're getting ready for another phase, for another campaigns. We're modernizing the military, expanding the military. According to our MOD, we want to feel the most powerful land force in Europe soon, and the society supports it. So things are happening like really fast in Poland. The language has changed. The attitude has changed since February 2022. Everything has changed in Poland. And obviously, Poland has skin in the game. We've been talking about reforms. You have written a whole book, actually, on the concept of the Polish army, which has been a big highlight in the Polish public. Poland, correct me if I'm wrong, is intending to spend 100 billion on defense. And 100 billion is, you know, a number that we need to put into a context that Germany, following the famous Zeitenwende speech by the German Chancellor, right after the beginning of the war, is also intending to spend. And yet, 16 months after, you know, after the beginning of the war, a single cent hasn't been spent on German defense from this propagated 100 billion. So how should we put this into the bigger context? You outlined, this is not just a regional war. This is not just about the revival of the Russian empire. I argue also that Russia is currently our sick man of Europe, just as the Ottoman empire was in the previous century. And we know what happened, you know, with the Ottoman empire. So it's the last so-called effort of Russia to revive the empire by positioning itself in this bigger systemic conflict between the United States and China. But how actually are our European political elites putting this into a bigger context? I don't see this sense of urgency. I don't see this kind of perception of a serious threat yet. We are not running our, you know, ammunition production, our weapon system productions in the European defense sector, as we should in the scenario of the biggest war on the old continent after the end of the Second World War. Am I correct with this or what is your view on that? Why isn't, why isn't it happening if we actually see the structural and the systemic processes ongoing, and yet our political elites are in a kind of a stupor, in a frozen state in which they just don't really act courageously and, let's say, you know, do the extra mile in preventing all of this from happening, in really denying Russia the long-term effect. And final remark, war of attrition, not just frozen conflict, is certainly more in the Russian interest than in the Ukrainian interest for obvious reasons. Let me split my answer in, into two chapters. Let me put it that way. First, about Poland. We don't watch what Germany is doing and we don't believe that they will spend sufficiently and they will deliver. We don't believe they will fill the, the competent army. For many reasons that I will refer to in the second chapter of my, the second part of my answer. So we're doing it. We're doing it, leaning heavily on the United States and, of course, with the delivery of weaponry from both the U.S. and South Korea and our own production. You know, our global audience should be aware that the Intermarium, the old Commonwealth, used to be an empire. So we are not a pushover in terms of mentality. We are not a peripheria, as sometimes Germans think. And it's been like, you know, we haven't been so active for 200 years because of the Russians' presence on the European peninsula, but that had not been the case for half a millennium. And it's just we are coming back. And that changes the balance of power in Europe. Both vis-a-vis -vis Russia, that we want 
this country to be removed from the political system and also vis-a-vis -vis Germany, because we, we don't want the Germans to run the show in Europe and European Union. That's why we invite the influence of the United States on the European Peninsula. That's why we want to have NATO troops. That's why we want the U.S. troops. That's why we invite the U.S. investment. That's why we buy U.S. energy. And that's why we are want to build intermarium with Ukraine and Romania and the countries here. And also that's why we want the United States to be a European power. And that's why we also closely align our interests with the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. Although we are not a great trader with China, we don't care too much, but still we, we want the United States to preserve its global predominance and its power, global power projection up to the rimlands and heartlands of Eurasia without the continental parts of Russia and Eurasia phasing away, phase, you know, pushing away the United States influence. It's against our interests. So this is all rooted in deep geopolitical reasons why we behave like that. Of course, we can separately discuss whether our military modernization, we can afford it, whether we, we choose proper things, but it's a different story, right? But we want to feel the force because we fear that the United States, which is a cornerstone offshore balancer of the regional coalition containing China might not want to be engaged on the ground, especially if there is a contingency in the Western Pacific. You know, sea powers don't like to be directly involved, so we need to carry the burden. And it, it's a matter of negotiations with the United States, how much we carry, how much they carry, what, how we modernize, whether we're doing it on our own or not, with the decision-making process, and what is the protocol of appropriate and proportionate actions under Article 5 if Russia starts anything against here. And the whole NATO doesn't, you know, reach a conclusion that, yes, we are at war. You know what I mean, this gray zone. So we need to sort of negotiate with the Americans, and I'm urging our politicians to do it, as some sort of a set of things that are in advance agreed upon with the Americans, how we can proportionate uh, react to any misbehavior by Russia in the neighborhood. Okay, without resorting to the global global war with the participation of the of United States. So this is one thing. If you ask me why the Western Europeans behave like that, I think the answer is twofold. First of all, I strongly believe, even more now than two years ago, that Germany and France wanted to eat cake, have cake and eat cake, simply by having an open global trading system without the need to spend money on their own military in Europe, because the United States gave this. Having access to cheap labor in the East, in Poland and elsewhere, having access to cheap energy resources in Russia, having a European Union as a beautiful machine to you know, control capital flows and investment flows and, and basically the productivity of their own industries. Having the, the Russia, Russian Federation as a buffer against China and this deal that Europe might be from what the Vostok, to Lisbon sounded to many European years as a quite convincing argument. You know, Germans, huge market, no need for war with China, without this sort of need to align with the United States, with their global concerns. Europe as a safe haven, social contract saved and so on. But those horrible intermarium countries always disturbing this peaceful coexistence. Yeah? And Americans always making waves because saying about China and those things. But the, the problem is for Germany and France that Ukrainians won at the gates of Kiev and the history changed. The intermarium is on the rise. And that saved United States in terms of its influence in Europe. United States is winning this war by, of course, proxy forces and deliver, weapon delivery because it's attriting the Russian Federation in a fully controllable manner. And that's a masterpiece of strategy, in my opinion. Of course, it's not entirely in the interest of my dear Poland because I would like the Russians to be crushed. And now the, the Europeans from the continent don't have an idea. First of all, they are losing power because the Poland, for example, is revolting. We don't want to have European Union that would be making deals with Russia. We don't want to buy the German weaponry because at the moment of crisis, they don't want to deliver. We don't have the same vision of the future of Europe, that Russia is part of Europe. We don't want them to be part of Europe. Macron even corrected his stance on that in Bratislava and his speech that he finally started to understand that reality on the ground is that Russia was losing the war 
So it turned out not to be a great power. So why the heck is inviting them over to the European system? As Macron had so often proposed, what is the rationale in real politics to invite them if they can't prove their case at the battle? So this is, you know, this, these are the times of anarchic and chaotic international system with military power is the ultimate leverage, of course, within the escalation ladder because of the existence of the nuclear weaponry, but still you need to control the ranks of the escalation ladder. You need to have the military power. You need to have a competent military strategy and leadership and Poland wants to deliver and Western Europeans don't. They forgot that the ultimate leverage is the ability to kill another man. And they thought that soft power tramples hard power <laughs> throughout the history. It has not been the case. At the end of the day, in order for you to succeed, prosper, enrich yourself, have a personal and professional life, you know, uh, prospering, you need to have a physical safety. That's why the Americans had the, the punch. And this is what saved Europe. By the way. And we simply in Warsaw do not believe that the Western Europeans grasp that this is the moment to make a decision. Or, Belina, I am wrong. They are so savvy and smart, and they believe that China will win. And then they don't want to be on the same page with the Americans. They still want to hedge. They still still want to be a separate pole of power in the world. So they don't want to align with the United States. And that's why they've been doing like that. But I don't know. Maybe you know better than, probably you know better than I do about this matter because we've been dealing with that uh, since we started talking to each other. So what is the Evelina I'm asking you? What are the leadership, what is the leadership thinking in Berlin in terms of China? Because this is, this is a final decision to be made that will, you know, put Europe into a proper perspective, what Europe is, what Europe should be. And that would also trigger European attitude towards Russia in the long run. Well, I certainly find that there are some positive steps in terms of conceptualizing in Berlin. We see that they have finally a security strategy. They have now also the first China strategy. But at the very same time, I think that it all stays at the level of constructivism, at the level of just mm. conceptualizing. And as you probably remember, I turned one very famous quote by saying that every constructivist has a plan until they get punched in the face by realpolitik. And I think that this is what, what Germany's experience with realpolitik is going to be. Zero action or almost zero action. All of this, the risking concept, which is a very much German concept, as we know, because the president of the commission is a German and it is really about actually saving what is left to be saved in terms of access to Chinese markets and chip manufacturing, because the whole pyramid on which the German economic model has been built on, you know, is, is crashing down. And that is a chip energy, chip security umbrella from the Americans, chip energy from the Russians and chip manufacturing and access to the Chinese market. So if they lose all three components because they have to do more in terms of defense, and you explained very well why there, there is not going to be any access to cheap energy commodities from Russia, if at all. And if they lose the third component, practically the whole success of the German economic model is going to be gone. And they have not the demographic, the strategic, and if you like, even the stamina to come up with a new concept and to adapt to the new reality. In the French case, I think that what struggles me most is that and you also perfectly, perfectly explained, you know, the current situation is that, in fact, the French geopolitical interests are at stake, specifically in the direct vicinity of France, where there are a lot of geopolitical interests that are now being hurt by the expansion of Wagner's activities. And that means, by extension, Russian state interests. So the very fact that France is being kicked out from the Sahel region is very, very bad news. In fact, no reconciliation should be on the agenda of Macron. I mean, what you explained with putting Russia on the security map, but in fact, the only strategy should be how to recreate security architecture in Europe, despite Russia's existence and despite Russia's presence on the map, because you cannot erase the neighbor but you can have obviously other strategies, how to coexist. And the only one is being militarily equipped and capable to 
actually make Russia know that it's not a good idea to attack or it's not going to be a good idea to attack in the future. So this is my, these are my two cents on the matter. But I have a final question to you, a very politically incorrect one. And feel free, of course, to comment what I just said. But my question to you is, there's not going to be an ordinary path for Euro-Atlantic integration for Ukraine. We know that. So do you think that we may see something very unorthodox in terms of solution, how to integrate Ukraine in the fastest possible way? Something like a political union between Poland and Ukraine and similar to the historical parallel from the 90s of the reunification to say, now that we are a political confederation or whatsoever, Ukraine automatically becomes a member of the European Union and NATO because all other paths to European and to NATO integration are absolutely, so in short and middle term, are absolutely unrealistic. Yeah, very interesting concept how to outwit the Westerners uh, in this way. I don't believe that this would be happening that way because of the hesitance of the United States. You know, if the United States were in favor of that and push for that, then Poles might have, you know, uh, sufficient stamina maybe to push it through. Without it, it's going to be difficult, but it's still interesting. But let me put it in a broader perspective, longer term. It is true that our Ukrainian brethren are fighting and we we formed the Commonwealth. But remember that we formed it also with the Belarusians and the Baltic states. The fate of Belarus will be decided on the fields in Ukraine, depending on the outcome of war. Actually, I don't believe that Ukrainians will give up on controlling the situation in terms of who is in charge of Belarus. It's, the peril emanating from the north is too gross for the Ukrainians to accept that there are Russian forces in Belarus and it has to be settled. And because there is war, I'm afraid it will be settled by arms and Poland has to be ready. The Ukrainians are training the Belarusian opposition army. Once Prigozhin Mutiny started, there was this appeal to the Belarusian citizenry to get ready when the hour is upon you by the Belarusian Free Army. This will be also a very sensitive moment for Poland and Polish military. In Poland, there are two parties, politi geopolitical parties. One party, which is an old commonwealth, zealots of independence and sovereignty. They would like to see, they, they've been supporting Ukraine like crazy. They want Ukraine to be part of NATO and EU, and uh, they would be even inclined to help them even more and even send troops to the Dnieper River. If the Russians didn't have nuclear weaponry, I, I think the, the Polish soldiers, uh, the volunteers would be there like you know, in numbers. And those people might be pushing for some sort of, like the president of the Republic is in favor of that. They would like to see some sort of a trade union, you know, something, there are voices about it. And Zelensky, when he visits Poland, he even tries to speak Polish about this. There is this vibe, there is this vibe. And as a strategy in future, we are also in favor of seizing this moment and removing Russia from the, from the intermarium and trying to create a completely new situation here. This is true. And in this way, Ukraine is effectively a NATO member because in the balance of power, it pins down the Russian forces. And if NATO does not adjust to reality on the ground, it will be obsolete. And there will be coalition of the willing or hub and spoke system. United States as a hub with Poles, Ukrainians, UK doing the job. Okay. So NATO will be an empty shell. So either NATO will adjust to the reality on the ground, the Ukrainian fighting in favor of NATO and on behalf of NATO or not. And then we will have a coalition of the willing. And then one might expect, especially if the contingency in the Western Pacific are stringent, stringent, that the, we will move towards some sort of the Polish-Ukraine military alliance that will contain Russia. And we can deliver that. And Sweden and Finland and Baltic states and Poland and Ukraine, we can easily contain Russia, easily. And then it will be not only about containing, it will be also about making sure that Belarus is moving towards the proper direction.
it will be very Promethean in terms that we will start talking about other peripheral ethnic groups of the Russian Federation moving away. And, you know, Ukrainians are at war and they're openly talking about it. And imagine this, such a conversation in the Berlin TV station. And Verena, the audience in the West must understand that this is a reality on the ground here. I'm sitting in Warsaw and we have the Wagner Group in Belarus. What if they started a raid against a town in Eastern Poland? What our military will do? Shall we act preemptively? Shall we use the precision weaponry? Or shall we use a mass artillery bombardment against our own infrastructure? Will we use the military or special operation forces, the police or the border guards? Shall we consult with the Americans in advance or after we do something? What about Article 5? What about the Germans accepting that this raid is happening? even if it's against their interest to keep the things calm. Who is to be making a decision? Us in Warsaw or some NATO? You know, we need to have protocols for that. And what is it, as I said before in the conversation with you, what is a proportionate answer that has been agreed upon with the Americans in advance to that action? This is reality that we're facing now. It's not a theoretical thing. Whether we deterred by, by denial, we deter by punishment or by punishment in advance or advance prompt notification of punishment. You know, there are many kinds of deterrence that we could employ here just to show. And it has to be within the framework of NATO and it's sort of coherence while the, our interests are completely different from the German interests. So how can we make it happen? But what you are actually describing and outlining for us is that an invisible iron curtain is already being in the making on both sides and you know the lack of protocols the lack of military to military channels of communication so all of this needs to be created and we've seen that there are already efforts on behalf of the united states when it comes to the to exactly this kind of protocols and establishment of protocols channels of com military communication with china because you know obviously our political elites are also in denial when it comes to the Cold War 2.0 scenario in which the most, let's say, significant hotspot here on the old continent is going to be along the eastern flank of NATO. This is going to be the new center, regional power struggle, and a very critical one from American perspective, which is why I would like I would like you to elaborate a little bit on that as a final as a final question. How do you see this? And will the overt support, military support, coming from China for Russia? Because we already know that they are supporting Russia by all means. We know for a fact that there are dual use goods being shipped, military gear whatsoever. So will an overt military aid from China to Russia, given the scenario that you also outlined, because war of attrition, the military help that is coming to Ukraine from the West, from the United States, is going to put Russia under growing pressure. Will this be the actually starting point where we say, where we finally admit this is a proxy war between China and United States in which Russia and Ukraine are being supported by the two systemic rivals? and how do you put this in, into a context? That's another tough question and even grand question. The question that might decide the issue of world war. I think that once the war started in Ukraine, the Americans convinced the Chinese not to do anything that would be comparable to the Second World War at least, but this time from China to Russia. The Chinese could really deliver the land lease program to Russia in a scope even bigger than the United States to Soviet Russia and during the Second World War. They didn't do it because Xi Jinping, I think, calculated that he doesn't want to have the open confrontation with the United States at this point of the time. Seeing that the Russians are the Italians from the Second World War and Hitler had to help them all the time, he started helping them, but without openly confronting U.S. sort of requests, at least to the extent that the help provided to Russia is still at the level that make the Western Europeans suspicious that the United States talking about the permanent helping Russia by China 
might just be only a sort of an excuse used by the United States to, to ensure that the Western Europeans are on the same side. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a subtle game of balances and the Chinese are very good at it and they've been doing it. Still, the Chinese don't want to have this protocol of safety protocols in case of incidents. And I think the, the reason why they don't want it is that they don't want the United States to use the brinkmanship too much. You know, United States has been the predominant force in the Western Pacific since we remember. So the global public opinion has been accustomed to seeing the United States ships sailing, Americans having harsh talk, Trump saying about war, you know, sort of in a way, it's a, you know, hegemon can do it. So it's, it's within stability. I mean, this is stable because hegemon has it. The, the rise of China has created a situation where the Chinese say are doing something contrary to the everyday life. You can't do it. So the Chinese look like always breaching. And the Chinese are thinking that the US brinkmanship is teasing them so that they respond, creating the impression on the Western Europe, uh, public opinion that the China is an aggressive act. That's why the Chinese don't want to have the protocol because they want the United States to fear the war because there is no clear definition what is in breach, breaching on it. And the last thing before we end, that's why I fear the coming 2024 very much, very much. Because if you have a competition as between US and China, still both parties wants to want to win the competition within a, some sort of a stable framework of how the competition looked like. Like Soviets and the Americans, still they didn't start the open nuclear war because there were some rules, red lines. And here there are no, there are no, in order to contain China, you need to uh, roll back. There are no red lines. There are no protocols. There, competition is also about trade technology and all other things that require roll, rolling rollbacks. Plus, and to the, there is no stability. And on top of that, 2024 will bring two highly destabilizing events in the relationship that might change the perceptions of who is winning, who is losing. The first one is the election in Taiwan. If either of the, you know, Kuomintang or liberals will win, they can destabilize the perception both by the Chinese and the Americans. Kuomintang, because there might be a secret re, you know, reunification discussions. The Americans might feel weakened by that. If the other guys are winning, the Chinese from the continent may be scared that he wants to, you know, declare the full independence. And then in the autumn, we have the U.S. elections and the United States being a hegemonic power for a long time, the U.S. presidential candidates are outspoken. They, they tend to think as in our relationship, when someone is controlling the escalation is predominant, even in the, in the marriage, so to speak. Yeah. So quickly goes up to the highest escalation rank because it's not afraid of someone going away or someone, you know, mm -hmm. and the Americans are used to it. Why the structure of power has changed. The Chinese might not accept it. And still this mixture of being weak and strong, empty talk will create an incredibly vicious circle of possibility of incident like Sarajevo towards the end of 2024. And this is what we fear as strategy in future, very much so. Okay. Cause I see no way China and the United States making any deal that will save peace without structurally weakening and alienating their own structural interests. Maybe I'm not competent enough, but I, I see no way how the Chinese will give up their growth for 1.4 billion people, right? And the United States will give up on its role in the international system and impose on trade, currency, you know, US dollar position, you name it. I don't know, Verena, it really preoccupied. The situation is very murky. I think we are in a scalable world war and thanks to the existence of thermonuclear weaponry, parties have a tendency to really mitigate to really think through all actions, not to escalate. Yeah, we will see. Mm. This is, I think, a good way to finish this conversation to be continued. Obviously, our audience should also go and watch Oppenheimer because we both, I think, are part of the realist school of international relations, which is convinced that nuclear weapons actually stabilizes the, the global 
and regional power competition and it reduces the risk of direct military conflict, given the fact that they have nuclear weapons. Think of the most recent military tensions between India and China, where they always have casualties and injured, but still keep, of course, the the level of escalation be below the threshold of a direct military, practically of a nuclear war. So let's agree to continue this conversation. Sure. And I fully agree. Certainly. And unfortunately, we will have plenty of hot topics to discuss in 2024. I think that the war of attrition will probably and likely continue even until 2025, but let's just, you know, stick to the tactical level what is happening now because every phase can actually have anticipated second order events thank you very very much for being with me for the last hour and thank you for the open discussion for the honest assessment that you gave us dr jacek bartoshak and make sure to buy his books and read his actually posts on twitter on social media thank you Jacek. thank you Bernia. that was that was great thanks